morning. Welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. I am Justin, pastor, church planter. Glad everybody's been able to join us today on the Daylight Savings Time Sunday of the year, which is pre predictably the lowest attended Sunday in the year. Honestly, we've seen that as a church plant in the last uh, four years, that this has been the lowest Sunday of the year. But we're glad in God's providence, you're all here, and I'm here. I've actually almost missed a service as the preacher one time due to this issue back before iPhones helped me uh, to get to the church. Uh, now, I'll tell you the story later, but let's get to it today. <laughs> My, it's all true. Everything's true, it's all true. Hey, so on our, our, this is our nice little logo here on the slide. You're going to see as we're, as we're looking at this service today, uh, the theme of the day is how to be a fool. How to be a fool. Uh, we've been looking at the first chapter of Romans. And, and Romans, which is probably the most influential book in my life and, and really in the, in the life of the church throughout the centuries, uh, it begins with the bad news. And then all people suppress the truth of God and unrighteousness. And it leads to folly, a futile mind, a mind that's closed to God, which leads to all measures of idolatry and dishonorable things, uh, things that would not, not be done. And the root of this is, is exchanging the glory of the immortal God for the images of creatures. And that's where we live. That's where we live. And so, if we were to skim through this and, and act like it's not there, we would actually lose a profound blessing in knowing how God saves us from what we are and, and, the, and the sure glory of Him relating to someone like me. Uh, and that's, that's the, the, the awe and shock of Romans is that we're all included in verse 18 of Romans 1. And, and we all manifest our, our changing God for created things, wanting to fashion the way we want it to be. We're all involved in that. So it's a very serious topic today. I want you to be aware of that as we go into it. But I promise at the end, there is more hope than you could ever imagine. There's more glory than you could ever imagine at the end of this uh, uh, Sunday today. As we're going to celebrate communion and how we're washed in the blood of Christ, once were these abominable things. Now we're all clean in Christ. So this is a beautiful thing, a beautiful day to serve, to serve the Lord through worship. We call it serving the Lord through worship because it's a liturgy. It's the work of the people. Uh, we'll be doing revelation response. Uh, that's the, that's the, the flow of our service. We hear the word of God and respond appropriately. So if you have one of these bulletins, take it and, and open it up and you'll look at page two. And so we're, we're, we're preparing our hearts for worship right now. And I would direct you to all of those quotes. They're amazing. Particularly, we're going to read this morning, uh, well, I'm going to call it audible, and we're going to read the Rosaria Butterfield quote. Uh, it's it's on, your, on your service meditation at the top. It says this, sin is not a mistake. A mistake is taking the wrong exit on the highway. A sin is treason against a holy God. A mistake is a logical misstep. Sin lurks in our heart and grabs us by the throat to do its bidding. So I would come to the Lord. We're in danger, and the Lord rescues his people. And this is good news. Let's take a, a brief moment, quiet our hearts, breathe, and prepare, pray for the Lord to, to speak to us this morning. Let's uh, bow our hearts and pray. Let us now stand for the reading of the call to worship, which will be responsive on your bulletin and on the PowerPoint slides. Uh, you'll notice that we begin with the, the command towards God of teach me. We, we sit as those who are posture ought to be learners. And then we seek, once we've responded to his teaching, to glorify, give him thanks. And that's what we'll be called to do in this call to worship in Psalm 86. So read with me. 
Teach me your way, O Lord, that we may walk in your truth. Unite our heart to fear your name. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God with whole heart, and we will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward us. You have delivered our souls from the depths of Sheol. Let us pray. Father, it is a distinct privilege to never have to go to that place called Sheol uh, without your protection. To death, uh, with the sting removed and the curse removed, we will all breathe our last someday, yet we will open our eyes and dwell face to face in your presence for glorious eternal life through Christ our Lord. For you did not leave us dead in sin, but delivered us up to glory, raising us up to be seated with Christ through your work of regeneration, giving us new hearts, giving us new life, a new birth, making us born again. We didn't seek these things out, of course. You came to us. You chose us before we were even born, before we were even created, before anything was made. You knew us and you loved us. And in this great confidence where we come to you in prayer, we ask you, Lord, to hear our prayers this morning and, and help us to worship you rightly. Surely if you would give us Christ and his blood and his righteousness for our sins, won't you now answer our, our, our prayers and, and request to you to meet with us this morning, to, to send your spirit to teach us and to open up your words as we read it and preach it and pray it, sing it, see it displayed in the Lord's Supper. We need you to, to hear us and, and answer today. We implore you and beg of you, Lord our Father, to bring us new life this morning. Would you rescue us from sin? Sin that looks to, as, as, the, as the author quoted above says, grab us by the throat. What poignant language. We need to be uh, rescued from an assailant who, who crouches at the door looking to master us, looking to overtake us. Lord, we, we are uh, prone to wonder and we need your shepherding hand to guide us back to the path. We are sinners, yet we are also called saints, made saints through your gracious work. So we pray, Lord, that we would uh, live as is our calling to live under righteousness, to walk in the manner in which we've received Christ, and to die to sin and live under your righteousness all of our days. We pray that you would give us a heart of wisdom. We have many challenges that are that are very uh, complex, different ways we can go, and, and they're not clearly articulated and outlined for us. So we ask that you would give us wisdom to take the principles we learned today and use them for living in, as a worker and witnesser uh, of you and a worshiper of you today. We ask these things for your glory, not our own, and we boast not in our own strength alone, but in yours alone, Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. We pray according to the example you gave your disciples to pray also, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We believe that grace drives out corruption. This is what our, our previous slide teaches us. We're going to look at hymn number 521. Would you please sing with me? My hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on
lesson from the Psalms. We're going to be looking at the Psalms as a prayer book for our faith to sing and bring all of our uh, emotions to God and needs before him. And we're looking at the second one, which is the second of an introductory, uh, of the introductory material of the Psalms. And we'll see that in the next Psalm, they're going to be uh, moving into prayers for uh, help. But as we look at Psalm 2, we must mention Psalm 1. Psalm 1 was a, a tale of two paths. One, one leads to fruitfulness and blessings, and one leads to disaster. And, and so here's, here's where the, he's going to carry out to the end. Where does the wrong path go? So let's look at the this, this second Psalm, verses 1 through 12, and we'll comment briefly on it. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of a decree, the Lord said to me. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Now this is a psalm that talks about kings. Uh, One king is the one set up by the Lord, the anointed one, the Christ. And it says that the nations take their stand against him. The kings raise uh, a rebellion against him. And so our question is, is in which king do we trust? Or will, we, will we align with the kings who rail against God and seek to overthrow him? Or will we kiss the son? Will we kiss the son lest he be angry? And with that said, I want to read to you what's on the previous page, on the bottom of page two, which is a quote from James Montgomery Boyce in his commentary on this verse. He, he ends his commentary with this. He says, The rulers of this world are in danger of a final fierce destruction. Make sure you are not among them. The rulers of the world rage against Christ, but why should you? The hands that he holds forth for you to kiss are the hands that were pierced by nails when he was crucified in your place. One day he is coming as the great judge of all. On that day the wicked will be punished, but today is the day of his grace. He invites you to come to him It is a reminder that the only refuge from the wrath of God is God's mercy unfolded at the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. That said, we're going to now confess our sins to him publicly and in private and then hear his words of kingdom grace to us. He's the good king who dispenses his grace upon us. So let's confess, pray. We'll use the model prayer on the top of page four. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, who has given unto us thy dear Son to be our Lord and King, grant, we beg you, that you would destroy and dissipate by your marvelous wisdom all enterprises devised and directed against him throughout the whole world, and make us to profit and grow in your holy law and doctrine that in all fear and reverence we may serve you, that in the end we may attain to that endless joy which we hope to receive through the same Jesus Christ, your Son. 
Amen. Amen. If you look up and hear the words of assurance from Colossians 1, 13 and following, it says, He, God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Amen. If you'll, be, uh, you'll remain seated again for the confession of faith. Now, This transfer out of the domain of bad kingship and darkness and transfer into the kingdom of His beloved Son is contingent upon one thing, and that is that we have faith in Jesus Christ. If we do not have faith in Jesus Christ, there is no hope of any future glory, no hope of escaping the darkness. But if that is your faith, I'll ask you to confess with me this ancient confession of faith called the Apostles' Creed, which outlines the basic doctrines of our religion. I ask you, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to sing a great and wonderful hymn, which will not be Great is Thy Faithfulness. We'll sing that later. We're going to sing... How deep the Father's love for us. And those words will be printed on the PowerPoint. If you'll please stand and sing with me.
have lots of resources here to take and, and, and benefit from. The offering plate is here in the back if you need to give an offering. That's our next order of business. We're going to collect high offerings. We're not going to pass it because it's so trying to be sensitive to COVID and passing on germs unnecessarily so we won't be passing plates and passing the elements of the Lord's Supper today. We'll be uh, directing you to go and get them and they'll be laid out for you on the back tables there as well you know, when the time comes. But with that said, we're going to now uh, join in a congregational prayer and then we'll uh, observe the tithes and offering time through singing the Gloria Patri. So let's now go and end in, in prayer. Our gracious God in heaven, Lord, we have much to be thankful for, many things to bring to you today. We hallow your name, of course, saying that all the blessings we have come from you. Uh, you need nothing, but you give so generously. You don't need our praises even, Lord, but, but you do receive them, though tainted by sin they are, though uh, half-hearted they might be, even our prayers, uh, self-interested, half-hearted, unbelieving even sometimes, and, and, and cynical, uh, your spirit takes them up and, and perfects them uh, to, to bring them to the place of mercy where Christ rules with mercy and, and justice and truth and, and grace. And so we ask now that you would hear our, our prayers Many of us have struggles and, and issues that uh, we don't even want to name, uh, secret sins and, and hurts, and, and ask that you would meet us in those times and help us to trust in you and your wisdom in all of these things. Lord, we ask that uh, you would bring about repentance in us and in those who offend us, repentance for those who are running from you uh, and, and that we are in connection to as members of the church and as friends and in relationships with, we ask that you would rescue them through the witness of your gospel. Lord, is it as we know that uh, your kindness leads to repentance, part of your kindness is giving us the words to say and the, the sacrificial love to give uh, when you found us, we were not deserving of it, and we ask that you would enable us to, in, in, to extend the same mercies and undeserved favor toward those who sin against us. We ask that you would help us to forgive those who sin against us, and we ask that you would do these things for your glory and not our own. Many of us are struggling with sins that are, that are very hard to overcome for us, and we uh, have thrown up our hands and don't know if we'll ever be free, and we ask that you would uh, give us hope that that will one day be true, that you're never going to leave us or forsake us, and that you're working perfectly in your perfect timing. We know that you don't tempt us. That would be against your character. But we know that the evil desires that still remain in us uh, lead us into temptation. And we ask that you would help us to crucify those, to put them where they ought to be. As, they're, uh, as those sins are paid for on the cross, we would we would never nurture them uh, in our hearts. And and seek salvation in them or seek joy in them, we put them to death. Drive the principle of life out of them. The things that, that charm our hearts, we, we, those things become detestable to us and bitter. And may you become sweeter, Lord Jesus, we pray. Lord, it is our, our deep desire to see your church expand and grow. And so we pray that even today that you would be driving many to, to, to hear this service online, the recording, and and to, and to consider attending. And we thank you for the, the joy that the vaccine brings to us, uh, that we might see many more uh, uh, in this neighborhood and at this campus to, to come to, to, to unite with your church here at this location, with Trinity Presbyterian Church. We pray for the, the numerous outreach that we hope to do in this community, and the ways we can serve this community and love the, love the people of it and serve them. Or we ask that you would uh, give us vision for that. Give us hearts to serve and, and to use our gifts. We pray that you'd use all the gifts that we have here for your kingdom and for your glory. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, work in us to, to be faithful to what we have, good stewards of what we have in the, 
the gifts that you've given to us and as we give them back to you and the tithes and offerings as you build up your kingdom and your church through it. We pray for missionaries. We pray for the churches in our presbytery that are laboring this morning. We think of Trevor and Melissa Rayborn at, at Vero Beach Church there, Morning Star. We thank you for their uh, faith in you and faithfulness to, to reach their community, to be a church there for, for Vero Beach. And we ask that you would give them uh, a heart for, for, for those, those neighbors that they dwell alongside of and, and the many that are coming to their church would be blessed through them. We thank you for Raul and, and the church in, in Sepulpa. And we ask, Lord, that you provide a building for them as they're ready to, to, to start looking at properties and, and, and where they can locate for a more permanent home. We ask that you'd give them uh, the things that they need in, in order to do ministry that would glorify you, be faithful to your, to your, uh, to your word and to your mission. Lord, we thank you that we can know you and relate to you through your word and spirit and, and ask that this morning that you speak powerfully through your word, that you convict us of sin and of righteousness and judgment and, and lead us to, to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation and for hope and for sanctification. So we get, pray that you'd increase our faith in all these things we pray that your name would be lifted up in our hearts. And we lift high the cross. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning, we're going to stand and sing the Gloria Patri together. And that will be printed on the PowerPoint slides. Let's stand, if you will. Glory be to the Father and to the in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen Amen You may be seated and if the children would now go with Dr. Ryan and Miss Stephanie for the catechism lesson which will be about 15 minutes and they will join us for the remainder of the service after that time. Uh, the question, just for the adults here, uh, if you want to know it, I'll ask it, and uh, we'll let them depart while we say it together. So uh, it should be on the slides and on your bulletin. It says, what does the law of God require? Answer, personal, perfect, and perpetual obedience that we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves, what God forbids should never be done, and what God commands should always be done. What a wonderful summary. That's what our dear little ones are, t are learning right now and discussing. So thank the Lord for that time as well. With that said, let's turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 18, and dig into the Word of God this morning. This is one that we don't... It's not a favorite. No one, no one takes this verse and puts it up on their, their mirror usually. <laughs> and they have to get ready for the morning uh, work today. Uh, but uh, it's, it's very important and essential for us to, to get through the bad news, to, to get on to the good news. So if you would please stand with me for the reading of God's Word in Romans chapter 1. We're going to read 18 uh, through, 13, or through 23 as context and spend the majority of our time in 24 through 32 today. So hear the word of God. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, uh, for, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relationships with, with those who are 
with those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And this, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what it ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you. Our friends here, why are we standing and sitting in this place? Why are we here? Well, it's probably because I uh, was given a calling by Presbytery a few years ago, and, and I am here called to plant a church here. Why am I planting a church here? Because I believe in this town, in this community, in this city, there is such a hunger. And I, and I received that, that understanding sitting with college students and sitting with parents and, and of, of friends of our uh, kids in Norman, Oklahoma, and, and considering as I was called to speak to college students for, for 10 years or so, and, and listen and discovering what, what they were like and what they struggled with. I was struck by how they grow up in a, an environment, and we all do, where we are told that fulfillment comes in being authentic to yourself, self-expression, and that you are just fine. Nothing is wrong with you. Of course, marketing would flatter them and say that they are great, they're just fine, but let me add a little bit to you and you'll be even better. Uh, this is the world we live in. Many of our students are really smart, though, and they're wiser than some of the older folks who are trying to teach them. Uh, and the spaces that they are, they've, never, they've either never heard or they've forgotten that the constant affirmation heaped upon them really can't fill them. There's a secret things in them. And, it, and what I've discovered in those times is the same thing I've discovered about myself is that I'm not okay. And if anyone would ever try to convince me that I am okay, then they would be doing me a great disservice. Because I live on the other side of Eden. There's been a great exodus from Eden. I am not okay, and neither are you. None of us are, and we shouldn't say that what comes naturally out of our heads and hearts is the right thing without question. We should be questioning what we think, and you see that in college students who's, who look and they've been told, just be yourself, be true to what you feel and think, and everything will go well, and it doesn't. And they start to think, well, I don't think I'm okay, am I? And I'm here to tell them that you're not, and no one's fine. Nobody is. And so we lead with that this morning, that no one is fine. Uh, there's a, a great psalm that I enjoy. It says, but I still wake up shaken by dreams, and I hate to say it, but the way it seems is that no one is fine. Take the time to peel a few layers, and you will find true sadness. And the poets, as some have said, uh, the philosopher named Shelley says that the poets are the unacknowledged arbiters of ethics in our days. They teach us what's right and true, and, and some, when they get at a correct thing, it does resonate. And everyone, re everyone reasons, uh, sometimes it comes to great conclusions because we're all in the image of God and we feel the, 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 the dissolution of how things are and the sadness and the disappointment. You got, you know, Everything from daughters who have been rejected from their moms and their grandmas and their grannies sorority. And this is their dream when coming to OU that this is going to happen for them and it didn't happen. And you've got sons who are addicted to alcohol because that's the, the, the way they're trained. Uh, that's their social setting. And you've got young people who can't fit in. You've got young people who have been shielded from everything in the world. And the one thing they couldn't be shielded from is their own hearts and their desires, and they can't understand them. 
And they're wrong, and they know that, but they don't know. And the world's telling them, just be true to what you feel. And it's crushing to them because they know better. They're going against what, something that they know. Because as we see in this text, it says, everyone knows God, but suppresses the truth. That's what verse 18 says. And are you in that verse? Yes, you are. I'm in that verse. We all suppress the truth of God. All of us have unrighteously done that. If not, why, why a gospel at all? Why send Jesus, Jesus at all? Just to improve our lives and, and if we say the right things, have more blessings and material possessions? That's, that's what some would tell you, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we are all suppressors of the truth of God and unrighteousness. And though we ought to know God, though it's been shown to us, we would rather trade him for something we like better. We'd rather exchange him. For, we'd rather sell him and buy something else. And how, how wicked could that be? It's the one who made us. The one who, who, who doesn't offer us ill will at all. But we, we spit in his face and rather trade him for somebody else. Consider how evil that is. To deny God who made us and look for something better. So we're going a little bit backwards over the ground we've already covered. But as you'll see there, it says in verse 21, or verse 20, the end of verse 20, we're without, we're without excuse. None of us have an excuse for what we've done with God and the knowledge of God. And that even heaps upon our guilt. Is we ought to know better, we do know better, and no one we encounter is, an, is alien to the knowledge of God. We all know Him because He made us. We're, we breathe His air and we live in His world. We stand upon his shoulders and we punch him in the face. That's what we do. Look at the foolishness and the sinfulness that resides in my own heart and in your own heart. It is absurd that we are still breathing. Every sin could bring on the death and the wrath of God that we deserve, as 32 says. So we're, we're, we got this sandwich of our own righteousness. And the wrath of God that's due and the death due to our sins. And we're going to unpack these things today. And the, 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 key, the key concept I want to look at is the fool. What is the root of the fool is the first thing. Because it says in verse 22 that claiming to be wise, they became fools. And everyone is in that they. They became fools. That's us. How is it that we became fools? Uh, and so, we, as we think about this, uh, a great philosopher uh, in, who's read very, uh, I mean, when I say great, he's widely respected, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, says that God is dead and we have killed him, and churches are merely tombs of God. And what he's saying is that you can't escape the shadow of, of God because so many people have committed their lives to this religion, this hokey ancient religion that has nothing to say to today. And we have these vestiges of it everywhere. And we need to drive it out. And in some way, we have participated in Nietzsche's mission. In some way, we all do. We've all been guilty of seeking to kill God and trade him for something we like better. But see, the, the, the non-existence of God, like we said last week, is not like the non-existence of Bigfoot, the Yeti, unicorns, aliens, little green men. It has profound implications on us. Nothing has been built upon the supposition that those mythological creatures exist. But everything in our society has been built upon God. So to dispense with God is to dispense of everything. And you see where we are. We lose the idea that biological nature and creation determines what we are and we can determine what we are as far as race or gender or anything. We think we have the ability to recreate ourselves into anything we want. And this is the great lie. We claim to be wise. Look at our great theories. But we have become a fool. And now as you look at the root of what this is, I'm, I'm convinced uh, as you look at the definition of a fool, uh, look at the slide here. Where are we at? What's the, what's the root of the fool? I mean, the, the idea is that we actively 
grown up a fool and we passively become a fool, right? So actively we've exchanged the glory of God for the images of created things. We've engaged in what's called God making or idolatry. And with that, it says that God has handed us over to the things we want. How do you know God's uh, against you? What well, could just be giving you what you want, which is terrifying. What we are going after, God might let us get it, and that would be the worst thing for us. Listening to our heart and pursuing it could be the worst thing ever. Psalm 14.1 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And how often we have lived as if that is true. That's called sin. Sin is a denial of God. And as we look at ourselves and we're horrified, I'm reminded of a... Of a, a podcast interview I've listened to numerous times by Rosaria Butterfield. And Rosaria Butterfield, being interviewed by Nancy Guthrie, says that what brought her to Christ was reading the Bible as a book. Reading it. Going through it. Tearing it apart. Looking at it from a... It, does, it, does it cohere together? Reading it as literature. Looking at how the plot unfolds. Does it have coherence? Does it have authority? Do people view this as authoritative? She looked at it from any other book she would, she would review as an English professor at Syracuse. And she, she came to the conclusion that it ought to bear weight. Look, it has been authoritative. And, and, and like she was amazed that there were actually scholars who do their work of, of looking at the literary criticism of it and source criticism and everything else and tearing it apart. You would not believe how much has been written on every single verse of the Bible. She, her assumption was that, oh, these, these like... Neanderthal Christians who don't know any better are just blindly following this thing. Like, like, there is scholarship that backs up this Bible, and it is worth listening to because it's authoritative. And so she was struck by it. So she read it, and she read it in big chunks, seven times over. And what she discovered, and this is beautiful, after Genesis 3, and I challenge you to go read Genesis. After Genesis 3, she called it a bloodbath. Immediately, there's murder. There's lying. There's polygamy in the first chapter. Directly after the exit from the garden. And it's so bad in Genesis 6 that God says He is going to destroy every person upon the face of the earth and build it back again with Noah and his family. It's not a happy story. It, it is a very sad story. It's a dark story. Even when God picks up a people off of the scrap heap of the world, slaves in Egypt, and makes them his own, they ought to be grateful, but they're grumblers and they, and they, and they squander all of his blessings and are, are run off into captivity by, by other nations because they don't trust in the Lord and they worship other gods, just like we talked about in Romans 1. With that background comes Christ, comes light, comes the Spirit. And there's real hope for those who are idol worshipers to be transferred or exchanged back into glory. True and tangible hope because God gave us the Lamb, His own Son Christ, who could bear the weights of our sins on the cross and give us the righteousness that we owe God through His life as a substitute for our own. And we have the blessing as believers of receiving that by faith alone knowing that no act of sin can separate us from the love of God, no act of rebellion because we have security in Christ. And some people say, well, you shouldn't preach that because that's going to make all of you guys go out and do anything you want to do. And I'll be like, well, you weren't listening, if that's true. Uh, if that's what you want to do, you haven't heard it. Because that's what, uh, I, how would I ever turn my back on someone who's loved me that well? It's absurd. How would I ever leave this person? Now, I will sin against God, and you will too, but we will come back and we will repent and we will grieve over that sin because it is against our new nature in Christ. We're made new. Now, we start out as fools, though, and we, and we engage in this bloodbath. And so the, answer, the, 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 the verse there in, in 24 is God gave them up. In verse 26, He gave them over. In verse 28, God gave them up to a debased mind. As you look at these givings up, that's the same word in the uh, Septuagint, the Greek word, or the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, same word there for when God would hand the enemies of, of God over to his people. 
I mean, they fought battles without even a single shot, a single arrow, because God would hand them over. He's sovereign. He hands them over. Also, it's the same word used for Israel when they were handed over to their enemies. God moves everything. And if we think we are apart from God, we're gravely mistaken. Folly begins in thinking we live autonomously from God and imagining we can make our own way and follow our own path because we know that God hands over everything. Stephen in the sermon at Acts 7.42 says that uh, because of Israel's idolatry, God turned and gave them over, same word, to worship the host of heaven, the stars, the moon, the sun. They worship created things rather than the creator. He gave them over to worship the gods of the nations. You think you're in control, but you might be just given over. And that's a very scary place to be. Handed over to uncleanness. What's Paul mean by that? Uh, it says, if you look at verse 24, God gave them to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring their bodies among themselves. It has a sexual contone, a tone with the dishonoring of the bodies. In verse 25, they exchange the truth of God about truth about God for lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So idolatry is the root cause and that coordinates with God, handing us over so that we will do all measure of detestable things and we're prone to it. Now God's not implied to be the cause of sin here. That would contradict what James 1.13 says, that God doesn't tempt us. But it's the uncleanliness in our own hearts, the passions of our hearts that we need to be rescued from. And we cannot rescue ourselves. We need God to do that. But there's hope that He will. Okay, so God does not simply let this let us go but he actually is active in this you need to know that while we're passive he's active in pushing us down that road and that cycle of ever increasing sin and there will be no end to it if he doesn't intervene if he doesn't bring us back that's awful awful and that's where we all that's what we're all prone to we're all uh, in, in danger of this and if god's handing us over to people that's not the last word though because christ came he handed over his people, and he had a people, he had a remnant, he was going to redeem. It wasn't the end, it was discipline. Sometimes God hands us over to the things we want for discipline's sake. And we've got to know that too. It's not always retributive and, and end, but it's loving handing over for a time. And withdrawing his presence, as the Westminster Confession says, for a time. But restoring that at the time. Now, second point here, we've looked at what is the root of the fool but then what is the fruit of the fool? A fool says in his heart, there's no God. I'm going to do life as it, as it pleases me and make my own way. And that's going to end up in unnatural and unmortified sexual desires and practice. That's the first example he uses. Unnatural and unmortified sexual desires and practices. Now, I won't go into too much detail here, but I will say that a lot of people want to want to. Want to quibble with the Bible and say it only has six verses that really talk about homosexuality and lesbianism and the whole array of LGBTQ. And that may be true that it only is explicitly mentioned there. And it also may be true that the word homosexual does not, does not actually appear in the Bible because that wouldn't be a Jewish way of talking about it. It was men exchanging natural relations for unnatural ones. That's how you say it in Hebrew. So just because the word's not there, the Trinity's not there either. You want to quibble with that one? And occur with providence, I'll, I'll measure things. Like, but the concept is there immensely. And as you see it come through, that, that it's a, in a big picture way, homosexuality is not there in the Garden of Eden. When you see these two words for male and female in the Romans passage that we just read, it's the same two words in the Greek Old Testament in Genesis 1, 27. God made man in the image of God, male and female, he created them. Same words. Same words when Jesus is speaking about marriage in Matthew 19 and in Mark. And as you look at that, you think, well, that can't be a coincidence. It's, it's looking back to the creation as the order for how we should relate sexually to one another. This is the way we should, we should function in, in this world. So that's why he says, when he says against nature, if you look at uh, verse 26, it says, For their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. What is this nature? What's well, the order that God has established? That any sexual 
uh, desire and action and act outside of the design that God has given for it between a man and a woman is illegitimate against nature. It's against nature. And he highlights lesbian and gay uh, homosexual relationships in this passage as a starting place to look at where our minds go and where our lives go if we're unrestrained from the grace of God. And it says that the men in verse, it starts with the women in 26 and says in 27, the men likewise gave up natural relationships with women and were consumed with passion for one another. And, and some people might say, well, that's just not, that's, that's just talking about, hey, they, did, they acted against their orientation. They'll look and say, well, well they have this, this orientation that, that they should be following, which is, again, a, a very anachronistic way of looking at Scripture. But if you follow that, what they're saying there is that they, they went against nature and followed these passions for one another. Well, the, the, the answer to that is, is several places is in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 9, and the, parage, uh, the passage about marriage, it says, if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it's better to marry than burn with passion. Same words there for heterosexual uh, immorality. Sex before marriage, or without a marriage, or against a marriage. Uh, that, that's the, the, the idea is there is, is illicit sex that goes against God's decrees or his revealed will. Now, what does he say? He says in, in numerous places, Leviticus 18 for one, and it says that uh, you shall not lie with a male as, a, as, a woman, as with a woman. It's an abomination. You shall not lie with a male as, a, as with a, a woman. It's an abomination. So some people might think, well, that's, yeah, hey, that is just talking about temple prostitution practices in the, in the ancient Near Eastern world. And you just can't look at that and say that's talking about homosexuality as we know it with a, a established marriage and things like that today. It's just, it, it doesn't speak to it. Well, what does he say there in, also in Leviticus 20? It says, a man lies with a male as a woman. Both of them should be, have committed an abomination and should surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Now, it's a, it's, a, it's a repeat. Okay, now let's look at Deuteronomy 23. What's it say there? Verse 17. None of the daughters of Israel shall be a cult prostitute, and none of the sons of Israel shall be a cult prostitute. You should not bring the fee of a prostitute or the wages of a dog into the house of the Lord your God as payment for any vow. For both of these are an abomination of the Lord your God. So if it's talking about temple prostitution in the previous two verses, why would there be another explicit reference to temple prostitution in the law? They're different things entirely. And in fact, if it is prohibited because it is in view of the uh, worship to the gods there, so to speak, then it would be even worse. If it's a, if it's a part of that system of worship and, and religion, then it'd be even more aggravated sin against God. We wouldn't want to engage in that, that God calls an abomination. So these are things that uh, we must be aware of. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah in, in, the, in Genesis 19, as we see, it's a bloodbath. Uh, the, the angels are sent to, to destroy the city because it says the outcry against the people has become great for, against the uh, Lord, or to the Lord. And so it says the Lord has sent us to destroy it in Genesis 19, 13. And why is that? You see an example of it. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do, you not, no, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters. No, this is actually in 1 Corinthians. Sorry about that. Uh, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, uh, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And as such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Understanding that, uh, these Old Testament passages speak clearly. The Romans 1.26 passage speaks clearly. And, and what 1 Corinthians says is that it lines up homosexuality with all the other lists of, of, of vices there and sins. And it says these are things that you used to be in, but now you're washed. You're sanctified. You're justified. So it's saying that your problem is that this is a particular manifestation of your sin, which is against nature, and it should not be embraced as an identity. It should be repented of and, and forsaken. That's what he's saying. 
And so it's also in, in uh, 1 Timothy 1, it says in verse 9, Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, and slavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the, of the, of the glory of the blessed God, with which we, I have been entrusted. So as you consider that, you've got various different manifestations of the Ten Commandments being, being broken there. Through sex and through lying and through uh, uh, all bearing false witness and, and dishonoring father and mother. And it's all called unholy and profane. Now, to normalize these, indi- these identities, to, to identify ourselves as lesbian, homosexual, or any of the, the various letters of the agenda today, which is political in nature, is to not be consonant with a biblical worldview. And in normalizing championing these identities, it would be consonant with a therapeutic view of the world, which says, you make your own truth, you make your own reality, you make your own way, and shape the world around it, shape God to conform to what you feel. That's a motivism, where ethics are determined by how we prefer things. And where would that go? How would that end up if we all followed that? How could ethics exist if we all follow what we wanted? And that's not true. We don't live in that world. No one could, that would be absurdity. Some feelings are prioritized and lifted up over others in our world. We had a remaking of ethics in our country, in our nation here in our world. So as you look at this, uh, next few slides here, I want to show you this. Uh, that this is, uh, the next one. Next, uh, over here. Gallup finds that we celebrated this in 2015 that uh, gay marriage is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a law now, it's legalized. And so uh, that 5.6% of U.S. adults identify with the letters of LGBT. And the current estimate is up from up over 1% of the previous update on data from three years ago. Here's the next slide. Uh, this is, I don't know if you can see this, but what it says is that uh, there's a remarkable uh, increase of the B in the, in the, uh, uh, the letters. Uh, it's, it's remarkably increasing amongst U.S. adults. Hit the next slide. And then it says, in, as you look at generationally, from those born in 1946, next category is group. 46 over 4, 46, 46 through 64, 65 through 80, 81 through 96, and 97 through 2002. Exponential increase, almost 16% of those born in that six-year window there would identify with the letters. It's an astronomically increasing. And you know what? If it were, if it were up to me, I would be writing that too. And you too, it, 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 we would be right there. The only thing that's, that's preventing those numbers from being 100% is the grace of God. That's the only thing. We would all be 100%. We would destroy ourselves if it were not for God. Now you think, well, that sounds harsh because I look at people and I see them happy and great and great neighbors, though they're engaging in, in all these lifestyles that are and sins beyond the sexual uh, sins we mentioned here, that would be attributed to these things, and they, they actually seem to be more moral than I am. And you think, well, how can I, why, what's it matter? It doesn't hurt my pocketbook. It doesn't, hurt, it doesn't break my leg that they're doing what they're doing. Should I care? And I say, yes, you should, because this is against the nature that God's given us. And so we, we, we don't win by turning homosexuals into heterosexuals. Uh, we, don't, we don't solve anything there, but we present the gospel to all sinners. And we don't allow this to become something that the gospel can't touch. Because we're, we're robbing from us joy and sanctification when we don't put our sexual sin before the cross. And that's the, that's the great loss we lose if we want to normalize any behavior that would be against God's design. And, and, and so as you think about this, uh, Romans, I mean, Revelation, uh, the, the end of Revelation 21 says that uh, no one who's sexually immoral will, will inherit the kingdom of God, but only those who conquer. 
only to conquer, and sexual, moral, liars, etc., idolaters. Uh, so if we live according to our flesh, we're going to die. But if we put the Spirit by the Spirit, put it to death, we will live. And that's our great hope. By faith, we can put these things to death. We can put them all to death. If, but if my experience is a barometer of what's true, then I'm never going to kill things because I'm going to think they're good when they're not. I'm going to look at my neighbors and think, well, they're not hard. That seems to be fine. And I might decide to, 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 to dabble in it as well. On our own strength, we can't do this. It's too hard. But my desires are tameable and killable through a greater and more profound affection. It's through Christ. The love of Christ can, dw- can drive out anything, any sin that isn't good, even the ones that feel good. And, and some people say if, you're, if your sin doesn't feel good, you're doing it wrong. It's seductive, right? That's why we sin. It ought to feel good and normal and natural to us because that's, that's a struggle. Admitting sin, though, is not the same as repentance. Just saying, hey, I'm struggling with this is not it. We have to kill it. We have to put it to death. Crucify it. Now, what, the, what fills a fool? That whole list of things. That's our last point there. What fills a fool is all these things, all manner of it. Envy, murder, strife, arrogance. All throughout there. We could go on and on and on about these things. It's a list of vices. And, and as you look at that, what's the destiny of those who engage in these things? Verse 32 says that death is the, is the thing. So you look at the last slides here. You look at how in Romans 6.23 it says that, that the wages of sin is death. And that's what Genesis 2 taught us. Is that if you do these things, if you go against my commands, you will surely die. Not just you, but everyone else. Death is what we deserve. Right? But the free gift of God, the free gift of God is that there's eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So he says here at the end of the verse, it says that commending evil is worse than actually doing it. How can that be so? Look at verse 32. It says, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is absurd. To, to, to struggle with sin is one thing, but to just sit there and say, well... Just clinically, that's okay. And champion that, that's horrible. That's, that's to, to, to deny everything that the Bible teaches, that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. We're to put every sin before Him and, and repent of it. Turn it, leave it behind. Don't approve of it. Don't teach people to, 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 to run after sin because Christ died for those things. You know better than that. I know better than that. He had to die for me and my sin. I shouldn't let somebody excuse their sin and think they don't need Christ. There's nothing worse than that. That's why it's so bad. Now let's look at these final verses here. Look at Luke 24, 44. It says that, and it's on the slide here, it says that like God, Jesus closed their heart, he hands over these things to a futile heart, right? It says there, to dishonor passions that are already in there. Go to the next one. Keep going. Oh, we're not seeing them. Okay, let's go to it. Uh, Matthew 24. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, this is, this is saying the, the coming judgment, no one knows, it's going unexpectedly, uh, just as it were in the days of Noah. For the coming of the Son of Man, no one's going to know. They're going to be given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So, so we'll be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, we'd be lying if we told people that, that they need to repent because they'll feel better. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. It's going to feel like death to repent because, hey, they're, they're giving marriage. They're having a great time. They're feasting. And then the end comes with Noah. It's going to be the same with Jesus' return. There's going to be a lot of happy people. They're going to be very, very discouraged, ultimately, under the judgment and wrath of God. A lot of happy people. Happy in sin. That's right. And, but, but that's the good news is that, that the Lord opens minds. Look at what Luke 24 says. Luke 24, 44 and following says that Jesus opened their hearts to hear the Scriptures. He opened their hearts as, he, as, there, as this is after the resurrection. He's, he's walking along beside the two men and he says, let me tell you what the, 
what Moses, the prophets, and the writings say about the Christ. He had to suffer, die, and on the third day be risen from the dead for the forgiveness of sins. And as they heard it, Christ opened their hearts to hear the scriptures. The fools suddenly became wise. That's what the Bible teaches, that Jesus renews and transforms our minds. Romans 12, 2, what's it say? Y'all know it. I quote it all the time. It says that, that, that we're to be renewed to the transforming of our minds, gazing at the mercies of God. If this is true, there's hope for all of us that our minds and our hearts are not finished as we still have breath here. Finally, Thessalonians 1.9, it says, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. There is a Redeemer. There's a Deliverer. And he works in us that we might change and exchange the idols for the glory of the living and true God. There's hope. I, I can't change anybody. I can't change myself. But God does through Christ. You see it examined in the Thessalonians chapter 1, 9. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, it says again, that such were some of you. But you've been cleaned. You've been washed. You've been justified. You've been sanctified. We're to leave all of our sins behind. And God changes fools into wise believers in Christ. And that's the good news. Uh, let's pray. Our God in heaven, Lord, we feel uh, the weight of these verses when they say that each of us are helpless to change ourselves, but you change us. The accumulated debts and demerits we have earned from you is astronomical. We could never pay it back. We could never earn our way to you and never justify the immense and lavish grace that you have for us. But we hold this out as our only hope. Would you convince us of its truth and drive out all of our sins that we might glorify you, be reconciled to you, and enjoy you, that the world would see us as those who are full of joy in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our friends, we talked about things that are just not appropriate to talk about. Like, it's just not okay to talk about these things in our world. It's, it's labeled as the hatred to, 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 to go in these, these issues. And I want you to know that, that it is, it's hatred against God to not consider it. Because his body was broken for all these sins. There is no sin in which Christ was not broken for. Like, to, 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 to affirm them is to deny the work of Jesus on the cross. We do not want to articulate affirmation of these or any of your sins in our world. But to affirm the wrath of God is on us. And that's why we need the, the cross. We need the Lord's Supper to, to convince us of it. So with that, I, I want to tell you that it is so appropriate to consider that God gave us a meal to remind us. When that woman I mentioned earlier, who knew she wasn't okay, she knew it to read the Bible, you know how she knew it? People read the Bible with her. They lie in their own homes, day after day, year after year, answer questions. She said that their, uh, their love came with the house to free access to their home. And they loved her and God used it for the kingdom of God to build it up and to bless her. That woman goes on. And it's the same with us. Our, our, our relation with God, the love of Christ, and the house of We get to enter into his home, into his very presence, and, and enjoy him. And we get to extend that presence to all of our neighbors. It's a beautiful thing. Now, if you're here in Christ, this is for you. If you're, if you're repenting of your sin and trusting Him alone for salvation, you're in Christ. And this is for you. You need to take and eat this. It's good for you. It's good for your nourishing of your faith to say that by Christ's blood and righteousness, I am 
washed. I am righteous. In him. Declared him justified. Very well. And he sanctified me. He changed me. Now, when I, when I say that, I say it to you. But if you're not, that's not true to you. Don't take this. Let it pass by. And come to Jesus. If you have questions about this gospel and this message, email me in private. We can set up time. We can talk here today in any way and, and, and discuss these matters in great detail and pray through them. With that said, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us. Yeah. Our Father, God, we ask that you bless the Lord's Supper today. It is your Supper. We ask you to convince us of our own need for it and our power. Sufficiency in Christ, your own sufficiency to save us from the most violence of our sins, which is committed against you. We have been unfaithful, and you've been faithful to us, and we ask that the bread and wine represent to us the glorious hope of the gospel, Christ alone for our salvation. And we ask that you bring us into a posture of humility and grace, that we are uh, merely sinners saved by your blood, and then we extend the grace to all those who. Who, who, are, who are not part of us. And you strengthen us to do so uh, your merciless, a merciful uh, love for us, who are blessed by us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When I went to betray, you took bread. On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And giving thanks, he offered it up and said, This is my body, broken for you, taken for you. The betrayal is broken. And he held up the cup and he said, This is the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink all of you. This is the uh, new covenant in my blood. Put out the feet of your sins. Take and drink. At this time, I'll ask you to go and, uh, and grab the elements, and pick up the elements, and bring them back to your seat, and we'll sing, raise our tables together, we'll all to take it together.
pray. Father, your blood is sufficient for all of us who have dishonored the passions. Call us home to you through the blood of Christ. Let us live. To commit shameful acts, vile and embarrassed about, we pray that you would give us the assurance that the blood of Christ covers us. Do you see not our sin? Do you see the righteousness of Jesus? Forevermore. Finish. We ask the Lord that you give us all of us who have been filled with unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice, envious, murderous, strifeful, deceitful, malicious, gossiping, slandering, hating of you, insolent, haughty, boastful, preventing that even new evils, disobedient to our authority and parents, and foolish and faithless and heartless and ruthless, and all these things we've been all the way been guilty, and we ask that the blood of Christ would be sufficient in our faith to assure us of salvation and cover us. We pray that you call us all home to the presence of you, all your people, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Final words here today is that we have numerous Bible studies and meetings we've gone this week. Uh, the children meet and the adults meet prior to worship every week, and we go through, we're going through the attributes of God. Next week, we're also looking at the decrees of God in the end of week's book. In the Monday night after the word meeting, we cross hands this week, 5 30 to the next corner. Men who want to buy our son, you can see those are listed there in the bulletin. We'd love to have everybody join that. Uh, our church organization Sunday is going to be August 19th. We we'll move from church plant to full church. So plan, there, plan to be there for that. It's a beautiful day. Uh, Easter's coming up. Yeah, it's April 4th. Please spread the word about that. You might, people might not even know if Easter's coming. They haven't been out of houses here. Uh, so, uh, if I come to you and worship the Lord, the risen Lord, Jesus Christ, with you in our church, and if we would love to, to interact with you on ways that we can celebrate Easter in all its glory. And so, Ryan and I will be available to talk afterwards and hear ways that you as a family, individual, or a church are celebrating this and passing on a sparks new tradition here. So, that's, a, that's something we want to do as a body, and I want to hear from you all. So, uh, with that said, Next session meeting will be the April uh, 14th. So you know that. And with that said, let's stand for our final hymn today. Good morning, John Newman.
up and receive the benediction. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And the grace of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, be with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Remain standing for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.